Just in case I didn't uh, mention it uh, before, um, it is, I think, good to to note that uh, there was a very strong element. I think uh, most of us have probably read portions of um, Luther's On the Bondage of the Will, uh, probably aware that he had a very, you know, being Augustinian, had a very strong predestinarian perspective that um, you will not find amongst the vast majority of uh, Luther's uh, children today, uh, primarily because many Lutherans today are far more um, Zwingli, uh, I'm sorry, not Zwingli, uh, Melanchthonian uh, than, uh, than they are Lutheran uh, at that point. Um, uh, Melanchthon certainly did not uh, have as strong a view as, as Luther did. So uh, he had a large impact on Lutheranism as far as that is concerned. Um, but he does have very strong uh, words about it, especially early on. Uh, it's not so much a big issue later on in his life as it is uh, in that earlier period when he was still very influenced by being an Augustinian uh, monk. So uh, that is there, and uh, uh, if you if you read on the bondage of the will, that will that will come out uh, in what is, is said there. As I mentioned, uh, Philip Melanchthon um, was a teacher of Greek at Wittenberg. He was. Um, very, very close to Luther, very important to Luther. Uh, a young man, um, obviously, I, I do have some recollection of mentioning that today, if you go to Wittenberg and you take any of the tours, uh, the ultra-liberal Lutheran leftists uh, that will give you those tours, if they're even Lutheran, sometimes they're just atheists, um, will uh, point out how long it took him to get married and and therefore will question his sexual orientation and all sorts of stuff like that today. Uh, actually, he was just a very um, shy and retiring type fellow. Uh, Luther had to really crack the whip at, at, at Melanchthon a number of times uh, to get him to enter into the fray. Um, uh, he was also very superstitious, uh, and of course, most people back then were. I think I mentioned to you that Erasmus thought that the uh, the mosquitoes that were biting him during the uh, during the summer were were demons. Uh, Luther was suspicious, uh, superstitious. Melanchthon was as well, um, and uh, for example, he was thinking about going to England at one point. But a soothsayer told him not to go, and so he built a well in thanks uh, that is still in uh, Germany to this day. Um, but he, he wrote uh, Loci Communis, important themes in Lutheran theology that ended up being extremely important, as I said, in the direction of, uh, of Lutheranism. He only outlived Luther by about 14 years, even though he was... Uh, uh, so he didn't live, I, I don't think he lived to be as, as old as, uh, uh, well, let's see, 50, 50, yeah, close to the same age, but um, 1497 mm -hmm. to 1560. Uh, but uh, an important uh, person in the, uh, in the Lutheran movement. Likewise, around the same time, we have Martin Bucer, and we mentioned him in the Marburg Colloquy. Uh, I showed you, well, showed you on on my iPad, which really didn't help much of you, uh, really, since I wasn't projecting it, but that fascinating uh, painting that I showed you that uh, is there in Germany to this day, uh, showing the encounter at the Marburg Colloquy. And Bootser, 1491 to 1551, again, same basic time period, was a Dominican monk who uh, converted when Luther uh, debated uh, Eck, uh, he lived in Strasbourg. If you uh, have seen uh, the Radicals movie, then you saw Bootser uh, presented to you in that uh, video. Uh, at one point, Michael Sattler uh, goes and visits with Bootser, and, and uh, uh, when they, they cannot engage in military defense of Christendom, you'll see Bootser and his... Uh, 
compatriot pushing the, the cup away, mm-hmm. symbolizing we cannot have fellowship with you. Uh, you will not be welcome in our, in our lands. Um, he was, a, uh, as I said, a monk. Uh, he asked to be released from his vows, was, and married in 1522. So again, fairly you know, early on uh, in the movement. Through his influence, Strasbourg became a free city, uh, which is rather intriguing. Um, Calvin was a disciple of Bootser. Bootser was very important. Uh, there was a period of time, as we will see, uh, when... Uh, in Calvin's life, and we get to that here just in a little while, um, he is kicked out of Geneva, and uh, he goes to Strasbourg, and, and the, the small amount of time that he's in Strasbourg pastoring with Bootser, uh, a, a French congregation there, is some of the happiest of his life. Uh, Geneva was not a happy place for, for Calvin, even though he, would, he is most closely associated with Geneva. Uh, it is his time there with Bootser in Strasbourg that is uh, pastorally formational, I guess would be the way to put it, um, of his, uh, uh, his life and is a, a very happy time, even though the plague strikes while he's there. And uh, uh, Calvin uh, does not flee as many others did, but he stays with his congregation and he ministers to the sick and so on and so forth. Uh, there in, in Strasbourg. In the 1540s, uh, Charles V, who we have met before, uh, passed a law on worship that Bootser could not abide. He was forced to flee uh, to England, where he was welcomed at Cambridge as a professor of theology. Uh, he helped to develop Ang- the Anglican prayer book, uh, which in some greatly modified forms, continues to be used uh, today. Uh, all, almost all of our uh, wedding ceremonies, for example, were deeply influenced and determined, really, uh, by that uh, prayer book and the forms that were designed at that time in English-speaking worlds. Um, he was uh, bothered by the cold climate in, uh, in England, and so the, uh, the king had a German pot-bellied stove brought over uh, just for Bootser, which started an entire tradition of all the pot-bellied stoves in, uh, in England. So you can, you can uh, give uh, Bootser uh, credit for that because he didn't like the cold. Um, and so uh, Bootser wrote a book called The Kingdom of Christ, dedicated it to the king. I'm not sure if that was completely because of the, uh, of the pot-bellied stove, but, uh, but anyway... Uh, as I mentioned, Bootser was, uh, by, by inclination, was uh, a peacemaker, one who wanted to bring people together. He's represented that way in that, uh, in that painting uh, of the Marburg Colloquy, where he, you know, he was there, he's talking with Melanchthon. Um, he is more influenced by Zwingli's arguments than Luther's, as most everybody there was. And... Um, uh, yet, in, toward the end of his life, he likewise, like Luther, uh, writes a book against uh, the Jews. And so he is still very much a, uh, a sacralist, uh, the state church, as far as uh, that element is, uh, is concerned. Now, when we speak of the Reformation in uh, Switzerland, you will get argumentation uh, between uh, some of the, the there was there was argumentation at the time. I mean, especially because of the division that developed between the Lutheran and the Reformed. Um, there's going to be some type of an argument as to who was first. Uh, Zwingli would want to argue that he was uh, reforming at the same time that Luther was. Um, it's probable that he was a little bit behind Luther, how deeply he was influenced by Luther or had knowledge of Luther's writings, so on and so forth, is uh, somewhat, uh, somewhat debatable. What is interesting is uh, the nature of the Swiss it hasn't changed a whole lot in the sense that uh, you might identify the Reformation in Switzerland as a Reformation by democracy. 
um, it's not the same situation that you have in, uh, in the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, you don't have the battle going on between various electors and the diets and, and all the rest of that kind of stuff. Instead, what you have to try to do is you have to try to get uh, the people behind you in a populist-style movement. And so what you have in uh, Switzerland are a large number of disputations, uh, debates. And um, I certainly was influenced by the description of these uh, disputations. And again, you, you get to see one of those disputations, at least briefly, in uh, the Radicals movie. Uh, where you have the disputation between the Anabaptists and Zwingli on the issue of baptism and, and how it was sort of uh, set up and, and uh, how that would have worked, even though that was done in a fairly small room. Many of these disputations would be done with a much larger audience. And so uh, certainly, as I would think of uh, how Zwingli engaged in these, um, you know, coming into uh, a debate with a Roman Catholic priest, and he would put the the Hebrew Bible on one lectern and the Greek Bible on the other lectern, and that's all he would bring with him, and uh, and just uh, mop the floor with this uh, poor, um, only Latin speaking uh, priest. Uh, and of course, that was meant to have a major impact upon the people that were observing these things, because that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to get, you're, you're reforming by vote uh, rather than by converting princes or uh, political alignments or, or things like that. Uh, there's a, uh, just a different mindset in, uh, in Switzerland, which was made up of cantons. Um, and these cantons had to cooperate with one another in in some ways, because you know some of the interior cantons would be dependent upon materials flowing through other cantons to be able to get to them, and so what you end up with are some cantons that remain uh, faithful to Rome. And in fact, to this day, if you go to uh, the Vatican in Rome, uh, you will see Swiss guards at the Vatican. Um, and this has been a tradition for hundreds of years uh, where the Vatican uses Swiss guards for the Pope. And uh, that is a, uh, a mechanism whereby the Swiss can demonstrate their faithfulness to Mother Church uh, is by continuing to provide those Swiss guards. I'm not sure if those Swiss guards are getting a whole lot of work these days. Um, I just don't see Pope Francis as being real big into Swiss guards dressed like the 1500s or something. But um, be that as it may, they're, they're, I'm sure they're still, they're still there. So anyway, uh, Switzerland, fiercely independent, uh, which they can be uh, because of the mountains they're in. Um, you know, you, it's, it's a little bit like trying to conquer Afghanistan, uh, you, you can't, you know, every world power and empire that has attempted to move into Afghanistan has uh, encountered the same problems uh, in the form of mountains. And if you don't know, how, know your way through, and uh, the natives do, there's all sorts of caves and things like that, and... and um, they like to say in Afghanistan they've never actually been conquered by any of these world, um, world empires. And uh, the Swiss have their own very independent streak. And uh, geography is what allows them to be able to, uh, to do that. So what they have is you have town councils, uh, and those councils determine for that particular area. Then you have the entire cantons, such as um, uh, Geneva and Zurich, and uh, uh, those councils that run those cantons really are the ultimate authority. There's, there's not really a, an authority above them uh, that you can make, uh, make appeal to. And uh, so uh, this 
all the cantons together would be called the Swiss Confederation, uh, which would allow them to cooperate on some levels on what might be called national defense, but uh, in reality, for example, Zwingli is going to die uh, in battle against another Swiss canton, a Roman Catholic canton. And so there was a lot of infighting uh, a, as well. So it, it's not like t today uh, where you have a singular government, but you still have a very strong emphasis upon democratic voting and things like that in, in Switzerland. So the Reformation in, uh, in Switzerland, um, the Reformation begins primarily with the work of Ulrich Zwingli, uh, whose dates are 1484 to 1531. So he, he does not live long, uh, but he does not die of old age. He dies in battle uh, with, uh, as I mentioned, a, with Roman Catholics. Uh, he was a chaplain in the army, but uh, chaplains didn't just sit in back and, and do acts of mercy. Uh, he died with a sword in his hand. He died under a particular tree, which uh, today in, uh, in the Swiss uh, language is known as a Zwingli Baum. It was named after him because he died under it. Um, there are various stories as to exactly how his death came about. But um, uh, anyway, uh, so he does not live a, a very, very lengthy period of time. Uh, Zwingli's father sacrificed to give him a very good uh, education. Uh, and Ulrich was a very good student uh, and was very much taken with one Desiderius Erasmus. And so uh, Zwingli is going to have a deep humanist streak. Humanist not in the way we use that term today, but in the way that it was used then. Hence, ad fontes, to the sources, etc., etc. Um, he learned Greek and Hebrew. Uh, again, uh, a rather unusual uh, combination. Um, and when Erasmus's Greek New Testament was published, uh, Zwingli made sure to be one of the first people to get hold of the, as it was called, the Novum Instrumentum. Uh, and he then promptly uh, memorized all of Paul's epistles in Greek. Um, you can see why he would have been a formidable uh, opponent in, uh, in public debate uh, when uh, at that very early period when you know, the Greek New Testament was just becoming available, all of a sudden you run into some, some guy that has memorized uh, the entirety of Paul's epistles in, uh, in Greek. Not, uh, not too many people uh, today do that kind of uh, uh, thing. So, as I mentioned, in the uh, debates... Uh, that uh, Zwingli would do. He would uh, bring the Greek New Testament and the Hebrew Old Testament and the Latin Vulgate, and, and um, that is what he would utilize uh, because he had learned them so, so well. Uh, Zwingli became the Leut Priester, the people's priest, in Zurich in 1518. So 1518 is technically after... Um, the beginning of the Reformation in Wittenberg, uh, but again, that's just a date that we've that we've chosen. Um, in 1519, he begins a sermon uh, series on the New Testament, uh, signaling his initial break with Roman concepts. While well, Luther is already cranking out, we might call them booklets, but books. Um, and by 1519 is using terminology, late 1519 anyways, is using terminology of uh, the Antichrist and things like that in regards to the Pope. So uh, it, it does seem that, that Luther, uh, that, that there's a parallel track, but that Zwingli's a little bit, just a little bit behind, though exactly how much he's being influenced by Luther is, is, difficult, to, uh, is difficult to say. 
He preaches in the Grossmünster, which is still there in uh, in Zurich to this day. Um, impressive structure, um, right near the bridge where Anabaptists, under his leadership in later years, would uh, uh, receive their "quote unquote" third baptism. That is where they would be executed by drowning from that bridge, um, within sight of it. And, uh, well, everything back then was in sight of the, the Grossmünster because it sort of commanded the, the town right there along the, uh, along the river. Uh, when you visit Zurich today, um, some people won't bother to tell you this, but I know that my hosts, since I was teaching outside of town, uh, I don't know, about 20 minutes outside of Zurich, uh, they pointed out that as you walk the streets of Zurich today, that one out of every four people that you pass in Zurich um, does not just have um, property uh, of at least a million dollars U.S., but has walking around money of at least a million dollars. Um, the reason being, of course, that especially after World War II and during World War II, uh, Switzerland became the world's banking center. And um, so, for example, there was a tremendous amount of money uh, from vanquished nations, uh, Nazi Germany. Uh, that ended up in Swiss banks with no one to withdraw them, that money. And uh, this truly uh, led to a, a huge enrichment of this small little area. And, of course, Switzerland was neutral during the war. And so there was no bombing and there was no devastation and nothing had to be rebuilt and uh, there are many who would say, even today, that the, the, the Swiss sold their souls uh, for the tremendous um, material riches and uh, abundance that they have today. Um, but it resulted in, I mean, honestly, uh, the vast majority of those people walking past the Grossmünster. It's nothing but a dry, dusty monument. There is uh, very, very, very little um, societal public expression of religious faith in, uh, in Switzerland today. It is an extremely secular place, uh, despite its history, but that's the truth about the vast majority of, of Europe today. And so uh, everything there is absurdly expensive because if, if a quarter of everybody walking around has a million bucks just to, just to burn, uh, then you're going to charge what you want to charge. And um, I know that uh, one afternoon uh, my host took, the, took me and the family out for what was really a almost extravagant thing, because he has, I forget how many kids, he's got eight, something like that. Um, and we went to McDonald's. Um, and uh, everything there at that time, and it's uh, nothing, I don't think anything has really changed. Everything there at that time was exactly double of what it is here. So you could get a quarter pound of a cheese value meal here for about six fifty, and it was it was twelve bucks there. Uh, actually, it was thirteen bucks. It was thirteen bucks, and um, that was the low end. Most places in stores uh, would be about three times what it is here. So, it, it that's why it, you know we've thought about doing a trip to Switzerland, but we're not going to do it simply because. Motel Six is three fifty a night there. If there is a Motel Six, uh, so it's just absurdly expensive to uh, to try to do anything in Switzerland.
what you got to do is you got to stay in France and then drive over, see what you want to see during the day, and then escape back to, across the border to some place where you can actually afford to buy food or something like that because it's just it's only for the very, very rich uh, to, to be there. So uh, it's beautiful to walk around, but you walk into any of the stores and you just look at stuff and you just go, really? There, there are people that actually buy this stuff? And obviously there is, but it's not, not any of us. So anyways, back to the Grossmünster. Um, uh, during 1519, the plague struck uh, Zurich. And while ministering to the ill, Zwingli himself was infected. Uh, he suffered for three months with the plague, which tells us what kind of plague it was. Uh, there were certain kinds of plague you didn't suffer for three months. Uh, if, you didn't, if you didn't die within three days, it was a different kind of, of plague. Uh, and uh, following uh, his sickness, Zwingli is more convinced than ever to follow the new path of what we would call later on uh, Protestantism or, or the Reformation. Now, in 1522, uh, Zwingli marries Anna Reinhardt, but this is done secretly. Uh, this causes a minor scandal. Uh, in the same year, he breaks Lenten rules and writes freedom of choice in eating to oppose fasting. Uh, in the same year, and this is important for us, so 1522, uh, in the same year, he develops a small group of young ministers who studied the Greek New Testament with him. And so this is a, a small group, maybe a, a dozen uh, young men uh, who meet with Zwingli uh, simply with their uh, copies of Erasmus's Greek New Testament. And uh, they study the New Testament together. Some of the key men included names such as Conrad Grebel, Felix Mons, Wilhelm Reublin, which if you watched the Radicals movie, you know about Wilhelm Reublin, Johannes Brotley, and Simon Stumpf. Now, if those names do not ring a bell, that means you've not done much reading in the history of the Anabaptists, because all of them end up being uh, leaders in the Anabaptist uh, movement in years to come, though not for many years to come, uh, because being an Anabaptist over the next few years would mean that your expected life expectancy would be about three years. Uh, it's always something to keep in mind. Um, when, we, when we look at the theology of Anabaptists, and that term is used as such a wide group of people that it's almost irrelevant. Uh, it's not descriptive. Uh, but people who became convinced of a biblical view of what baptism was. It's very, very easy uh, to criticize those men because they do not, no, none of them ever gets to produce something like the Institutes of the Christian Religion, like Calvin would. Because Calvin has given many years, many decades of ministry. Uh, most of these men live three or four years, and uh, that's a very short period of time in which to be developing much in the way of theology. And uh, so it's important to keep that in mind. But all of these men uh, were students of uh, Zwingli, and Zwingli taught them sola scriptura uh, to the fullest. Um, and in fact, he took the perspective that if the New Testament does not teach it, we shouldn't practice it. So, as you know, there's different ways of looking at scriptural sufficiency, the issue of revelation, so on and so forth. There are those who would say, well, uh, we have freedom in matters that scripture does not specifically address, but Zwingli... Uh, goes to the point of saying, if it is not commanded, then it should not be done. Um, so in the same year, he attacks images and the mass, and the council does away with images and the mass. But notice it's the council that does that. So no matter, in, in Switzerland, it's still sacralism. It's still a state church, even if it's a 
a little bit more democratized version, I guess you would call it. Uh, the council is still involved in these things. The council is not necessarily made up of ministers. There might be ministers on the council, but uh, someone like the Lloyd Priester, like, uh, like Zwingli, would have uh, very uh, deep you know, impact upon the council, but it's the council that's actually doing, making the decisions and, and doing these things. And uh, it's, it's likewise uh, relevant that uh, Zwingli was an accomplished musician, as was Luther. But if you want to see a fundamental difference between the Lutheran Reformation and the Swiss Reformation, uh, Zwingli does away with instrumental music. Uh, there is an incredible organ uh, in, in the Grossmünster, uh, it will not be used um, because it's not taught in the New Testament. And so even though he himself is a, an accomplished musician, uh, that great skill and gift is not utilized um, because of the position that he, that he takes. So in, so, so, this group meets for about two and a half years. And in 1525, especially Grebel and Mans, but all the rest of them eventually, the discussion that, that comes up is the issue of infant baptism. And you know, this becomes very relevant to us in looking at church history as Reformed Baptists, because we have uh, a lot of uh, close relationships with our Presbyterian brothers uh, and sisters, and a lot of close fellowship uh, within the Reformed community, but we are divided ecclesiastically uh, by our view of the formation or order of the church, um, specifically in regards to having a presbytery over the local assemblies, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and especially in the issue of the nature, function of baptism. Um, credo-baptism versus all the various forms of paedo-baptism. Well, uh, it's not that this was the first time baptism had been discussed, but... This is really probably 1525 is where the origins of the debates we continue to have to this day go back to as far as identifiable uh, streams um, in, in raising these issues to the level of debate and uh, especially determining how the state churches and the Reformed state churches are going to interact with what they call Anabaptists. Um, the sad reality that from this time forward, there's not going to be a whole lot of good communication going on, um, especially in the sense of the majority church listening to what the minority uh, are actually saying about this particular subject. So uh, what happens, basically, is, all right, if it's not commanded in the New Testament, Ulrich, uh, why do we baptize infants? And there seems to be some indication um, from those early writers that at least at first, there was a uh, positivity in Zwingli's mind uh, toward this, uh, maybe a willingness to consider the case. Um, but as in later generations, as in the situation with Luther, uh, there was a deep, deep-seated tradition of infant baptism that, for example, gave you the church 
and they gave you the tax rolls of the state or the, or the baptism rolls of the church. They were one and the same thing. You're baptized both into the church and the state at the same time. You become a citizen of the state, you become a member of the church, all in the same way, and the idea of abandoning that was simply too radical for the councils. And so it's not that Zwingli proposed the idea and it was shot down by the councils. Uh, Zwingli was able to discern that that this is simply not going to happen. And so there ends up being a, uh, a debate. Well, first of all, obviously, Zwingli was a consummate politician, and he's like, look, guys, we can only go so fast. We can only do so much in so much period of time. And if the, if the Anabaptists had been willing to move a little bit more slowly, might there have been a different outcome? I, I don't know. It's possible. It's possible. Um, but even though it seems at first that Zwingli agreed with them, it was the, it was the speed at which they were wanting to push this that causes him to stand against them. And as a result, he changes his position and opposes them in debates before the council on the subject. And this is where you begin to get um, the development of a modern, reformed, covenantal-based defense of infant baptism. Because up to this point in time, uh, Infant baptism has certainly been practiced, but it was not practiced based upon uh, the concept of uh, covenantalism or or anything like that. And and I don't think Zwingli himself actually ends up coming to a fully developed position that you end up with with Calvin um, at a, you know a couple of decades after this. Uh, but he does have to come up with some kind of a defense because he's between a rock and a hard place. He's, he's taught his disciples, if it's not found uh, in the New Testament, we cannot practice it. Infant baptism isn't found in, in the practice of the New Testament, and therefore, why are we doing it? Well, the reason would be this, which re- requires a fundamental compromise. Um, so he does oppose them, and... Uh, as I said, in the film The Radicals, you see uh, sort of the end portion of one of these uh, disputations and dialogues that takes place. And so when they lose, they are told, you know, you can't teach this. You know, the council votes, and the council go with Zwingli, and uh, these are young, they become known as radicals. And so they begin the practice of adult baptism, which, of course, from Zwingli's perspective, is anabaptism. It's baptism again, because they've already been baptized as, as infants. And so Zwingli asks the council to pass ordinances against them. Um, and within one year... In 1526, he convinces the council to issue an edict authorizing execution of convicted Anabaptists. And um, initially, this is just to get them to leave. uh, But when they don't, then it has to be carried out, uh, or the words no longer have much in the way of of meaning. And so... uh, both with Luther as a result of the Zwickau prophets and his negative experience with Anabaptists and then Zwingli by 1526, you have in Protestant lands um, execution on the books and it begins to be practiced uh, against those who take a different view on this subject of, of baptism. Didn't take long. And the only explanation for that, again, is the reality of sacralism. It's the reality of the state church. And uh, that's why if you you don't understand that, you'll just never understand uh, how quickly uh, 
these things could develop. So we will uh, we'll finish up with uh, Zwingli, uh, review the Marburg Colloquy briefly, and then his death, and, and move on to other subjects uh, when we uh, have opportunity of being together again. Let's uh, close in prayer. Father, once again, we thank you for this opportunity of uh, consideration of your truth and your work in history. We ask that you would see us in light of these things, help us to always re recognize that we are part of a grand work that you are accomplishing. And just as those who came before us didn't necessarily uh, have a clear view of exactly where they stood, help us to be humble uh, and to seek uh, to have an accurate understanding of what you're doing in our day. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.